digital system. It would be obvious to state that innovation is the bedrock of fintech industry. Events such as these festivals enable sharing of knowledge and experience with peers both domestic and global, which would facilitate more innovation. By bringing regulators and fintechs together on the same platform, the festival also facilitates an understanding of the regulatory expectations by the industry and also it gives an opportunity to, uh, for the regulator to appreciate the developments which are taking place in the industry and what are the challenges which industry is facing so that the regulators can also respond to the emerging situation and to the emerging challenges. Now, such thematic events provide the right kind of platform for nurturing a more vibrant fintech ecosystem. In my address today, I propose to touch upon changes in the financial landscape with the advent of fintechs, with particular emphasis on the role of digital public infrastructure and the role of the Reserve Bank in fostering innovation. Broadly, what I have done is that uh, I will be highlighting four aspects First, I will talk about uh, digital public infrastructure, how it is a public good, and uh, this is one of the themes which India is uh, advocating, which India is piloting in the, uh, during our presidency, India's presidency of uh, the G20. This is there as one of the priority areas, that is digital public infrastructure. So first, I will touch upon digital public infrastructure. Second, I will touch upon some of the institutional arrangements which the Reserve Bank has developed over the years to, you know, to contribute to more innovation and to take this sector forward. The third aspect is specific policy initiatives, including some of the current initiatives which the Reserve Bank is taking, some of which are showcased in the pavilion, which have been put up by the Reserve Bank FinTech and the payments uh, departments. And finally, I would uh, like to touch upon a very important aspect of customer centricity, governance, and the need for self-regulation. The landscape of traditional financial services has undergone a profound shift with the advent of fintechs. This transformation has significantly impacted delivery of financial services by making them faster, cheaper, efficient, and more accessible. The global fintech sector, which currently generates about uh, $245 billion US dollars of annual revenue, which is merely a 2% of the global financial services revenue. It is estimated to reach $1.5 trillion annual revenue by 2030. The Indian fintech industry is projected to generate around $200 billion in revenue by the year 2030. This projection indicates that by 2030, India's fintech sector could potentially contribute to approximately 13%, 13% of global fintech industry's total revenue. These projections underscore the increasing significance of the Indian fintech sector. Technological innovation by the fintechs are the result of the interplay between three things. One, digital public infrastructure, two, institutional arrangements, and three, policy initiatives. These key elements help foster a conducive environment for nurturing creative ideas and promoting new technologies, which lead to beneficial and impactful changes in the financial services sector. Let me now elaborate on each of the three aspects. First, I would like to touch upon digital public infrastructure. Now, digital public infrastructure is commonly recognized as a technology system that promotes interoperability, openness, and inclusion to deliver vital public and private services. The defining feature of the Indian model of digitalization is the lead taken by the government and the public sector in building an infrastructure on top of which innovative products are created by the private fintech firms and startups. In fact, India has pioneered a layered approach to digital public infrastructure with the concept of the India stack. In this impact, the Im 
in this respect, the impact of the jam trinity, that is Jandhan, Aadhaar, and mobile, in terms of financial inclusion, digitization of financial services, and emergence of fintech ecosystem has been extremely significant. Now, Jandhan accounts, Jandhan Yojana, all of you are familiar with it, so I don't want to elaborate on it. A copy of my address will be uploaded in the RBI website, so the numbers and the data which are there, you can, those of you who are interested may access from that, so I'm not going into too much of details of that. But just would like to mention that as per the World Bank's Global Findex Database 2021, 76% of adults worldwide had access to an account in a bank account or a regulated financial institution as compared to 51% in 2011. That means the world average, about 51% of the adult population had bank accounts. That was in 2011. And after 10 years in 2021, 51% went up to 76% of adult population. In comparison, the percentage of adults in India who had access to bank accounts was 35% in 2011, and it went up to 78% in 2021. As you would be aware, the Jandhan scheme launched by the government in 2014 for universalization of bank account has played a significant role in achieving this remarkable progress. So far, over 500 million Jandhan bank accounts, that is 50 crore Jandhan bank accounts, have been opened in India. Now, so far as Aadhaar is concerned, Aadhaar, which is India's biometric identity system, provides a single and portable proof of identity. As on 30th November, this 30th November last, that is 2022, Unique Identification Authority of India had issued 1.3 billion Aadhaar identities, that is 135 crore Aadhaar identities. The unique Aadhaar identification number allows individuals to verify their identity through authentication regardless of their location, thereby ensuring convenient access to not only financial, not only financial services, but also the various kinds of financial benefits and other subsidies which the government is extending for, you know, for the needy sections. Now, Aadhaar has also enabled the fintechs to offer paperless and contactless financial services. And it has enhanced customer convenience, strengthened the security of the financial transactions, and substantially mitigated the risk of identity fraud. It's a good example of how digital public infrastructure can be leveraged for achieving public policy objectives. The third aspect in the Jam Trinity, as you are aware, is a mobile connectivity. Now, the mobile connectivity has also, in India has also grown exponentially. The number of internet users through mobile phone in India has grown from about 70 million, 70, 70 million in 2014 to about 800 million in 2022. During the same period, the number of digital transactions in India grew from one point, that is, I'm talking about the number of transactions. Now, during the same period, that is, you know, what I mentioned just now, that is from 2014 till uh, 2022. Now, during this period, the number of digital transactions in account grew from 1.2 billion in 2014 to about 91 billion in 2022. Increasing affordability of mobile phones, cheap access to data, and the expansion of mobile network coverage have spurred the growth in adoption of mobile wallets, UPI, and other forms of and other methods of digital payments. Now, let me also touch upon UPI, which is now very well known, which is uh, in fact has emerged as an international model and a success story. But let me also mention that, uh, you know, I would like to compliment the entire team of uh, NPCI and the team in the Reserve Bank for working together to, to take 
UPI forward. Now, this is one example of uh, public-private partnership. The UPI was, was basically primarily was an initiative taken by the Reserve Bank of India with the support of the Government of India. Initially, the initial push was provided by the Reserve Bank, backed by the government. And then thereafter, a separate company has been formed and which is owned by a number of banks. So the entire platform is a kind of a digital public infrastructure on which various private players, through their payment apps, they are riding on this public infrastructure. So the government creates the basic infrastructure. The public sector, I mean, RBI, I'm just putting it in that bracket of public sector. RBI strictly is not a public sector. But, you know, it's a public effort to set up a platform, to set up an uh, infrastructure on which the private sector is now developing, you know, is offering various payment services. And NPCI itself is also coming up with new products which they are going to launch from time to time. And I am happy that about four products are being launched uh, today by the NPCI. And uh, they, in fact, would demonstrate the capability of the Indian fintech uh, sector. Now, this has, as I mentioned, uh, the ability to instantly transfer money between bank accounts through mobile applications has actually transformed the way people make digital transactions. The interoperability of UPI across banks has created a unified payment ecosystem. Its user-friendly interface and QR code-based payments have made it very popular. It has facilitated digital payments for small businesses and street vendors, leading to greater financial inclusion. UPI has also spurred innovation in the fintech space, leading to the growth, of, growth and development of other payment systems. For instance, the volume of, for instance, the volume of uh, transactions through the Bharat bill payment uh, system, that is BBPS, has uh, grown phenomenally. Similarly, prepaid instruments, mobile wallets have also witnessed higher volumes in the recent years. The success of UPI is reflected in the sheer numbers as it has scaled up in relatively a short period of time. Often we forget that UPI was actually launched in 2016. So it's just about seven years now. And uh, this success is reflected in uh, the sheer numbers and more than 10 billion transactions for over 15 trillion rupees value were carried out in August 23. The numbers, the total number is steadily rising. India's technology stack has accelerated digitalization through mobile phones and internet, identity system, data sharing rails, that is the account aggregator framework, payment rails, and universalization of bank accounts. Now let me turn my focus to the institutional arrangements which have been, uh, you know, which have been put in place by the Reserve Bank over the years. Institutional arrangements, arrangements are also very critical for the development of a robust financial system. They undertake various functions such as research, innovation, training, advancing technology solutions, and developing best practices in financial services. They also promote stability, transparency, and fair practices in the financial sector. The Reserve Bank's initiatives in the in institutional building for the fintech sector in particular include, first, number one, establishment of the Institute for Development and Research in Banking Technology, that is the IDRBT, which has been playing a crucial role in shaping the digital transformation of Indian banking industry. Second, creation of the National Payments Corporation of India, that is NPCI, which has emerged as a pivotal organization driving the transformation of retail digital payments in India. Third, setting up the Indian Financial Technology and Allied Services, that is IFTAS, an institution to design, deploy, and provide essential IT-related services as required by the RBI and also by the banks and other financial institutions. Fourth, setting up the Reserve Bank Information Technology Limited, that is Rebit, in 2016 to strengthen cyber resilience of the Reserve Bank and also cyber resilience of the banking sector as a whole. 
Five, formation of the FinTech department within RBI in 2022. And six, establishment of the Reserve Bank Innovation Hub to promote innovation in financial services. Now, all these institutions over the years have played a very important role, and uh, the RBI Innovation Hub, which is our latest initiative in institution building, the RBI Innovation Hub has been supported by, has been established by the RBI, but the entire leadership, the entire drive is left to the private sector. We have provided the initial support. We are, of course, two of our officers sit in the board of directors of the RBI Innovation Hub. But as a separate company, it has total autonomy and we do not, the RBI doesn't interfere in its day-to-day -day affairs. But the RBI works in close coordination with the Innovation Hub. And uh, you know one of the products which has been developed by the RBI Innovation Hub, that is the frictionless uh, credit the you know the public tech platform for frictionless credit uh, that is the demonstrate that is being demonstrated in the pavilion put up by the reserve bank if you have the time please have a look at it let me now turn to the third area which i mentioned that is the policy initiatives which the reserve bank has taken over the years now timely and appropriate policy initiatives are absolutely important for growth of any sector more so the fintech sector the focus of our policy initiative in this regard is to promote a conducive environment for innovation and also ensure the security and stability of financial services. We have taken many such policy initiatives in the recent times. They include issuance of regulatory guidelines for emerging areas such as payment banks in 2014, regulatory framework for accounting account aggregators in 2016 for prepaid instruments in 2017 for peer to peer that is p2p lending and uh, uh, p2p lending and invoice uh, p2p lending was in 2017 and for invoice discounting that is through the trades platform in 2018 and the digital lending guidelines in 2022 on which we have made further refinements and improvement in 2023. In fact, that was one of the takeaways from last year's Global FinTech Festival, where I got a lot of inputs here. And subsequently, we had a meeting, and I personally attended that meeting with many FinTech uh, companies about uh, this, you know, many digital lenders, about the digital lending guidelines. And that required some refinement, some fine tuning, which we have done what uh, you know, what is commonly understood as FLDG, that also we have enabled with suitable safeguards in consultation with the industry. It was not a unilateral decision. It was done in consultation with the digital uh, lenders. Now, The regulatory sandbox framework was also announced in August 2019. That is again a recent initiative. And this was done to foster responsible innovation and promote efficiencies in financial services. The four cohorts of retail payments, cross-border payments, MSME lending, and prevention of financial frauds, together with the neutral fifth cohort, which is currently, you know, which is in operation now, reflect our commitment to promote innovation in the fintech space. Drawing upon the learnings from the first cohort of the regulatory sandbox, the Reserve Bank has put in place a framework for facilitating small value digital payments in offline mode, which should give a push to digital transactions in areas with poor or weak internet or telecom connectivity. Further, the RBI is now conducting hackathons to promote innovation. Our first uh, hackathon, Harbinger, was conducted in 2021 under the broad theme, Small Digital Payments. The second edition of our global hackathon, Harbinger 23, has also been launched with the theme inclusive digital services. Some of the current initiatives which the Reserve Bank has taken are basically the launching of the pilot project on uh, uh, CBDCs, both in the wholesale and in the uh, retail uh, mode, 
and uh, a lot has been spoken about uh, CBDC, so I am not uh, going into the details, but just want to say that uh, initially the pilot for wholesale was launched uh, to settle secondary market transactions in government securities, and now we are planning to test some more use cases going forward. The retail pilot for CBDCs was launched again in December last year, and it covers person-to-person -person as well as person-to-merchant uh, transactions. The pilot is testing the robustness of the entire process of digital rupee creation, distribution, and retail usage in real time. The pilot is currently being operated through 13 banks, one three through 13 banks across 26 cities of the country. Around 1.46 million users and 0.31 million merchants are currently part of the pilot as on 31st August this year. Needless to say, as the next generation currency system, CBDC needs to be introduced in a very, very non-disruptive manner. Therefore, we are following a strategy of calibrated and phased implementation. Recently, we have enabled full interoperability of CBDC with the, UPR, with the UPI QR code, and we are also targeting 1 million CBDC transactions per day by December this year. This will give us enough data points to study various design choices, use cases, and also behavioral pattern. Now, the other initiative which we have taken recently, which is actually currently in operation, is the uh, public tech platform for frictionless credit. Now, here again, <clears throat> the initiative is be being taken by the Reserve Bank because it involves coordination with a lot of agencies. It involves, so far as agricultural loans are concerned, it involves coordination with various state governments because the land records, they are digitized and that is done by the state governments. So you need access to the land records of the states and a private entity on its own will not be able to navigate that entire labyrinth. So it is Reserve Bank which can handle that aspect. So therefore, we are able to discuss, and it is done by the Reserve Bank Innovation Hub and RBI together. So with RBI's participation, the land record data, the digitized land record data of the states are being onboarded to this uh, platform. Similarly, we need data from multiple sources, including some amount of uh, satellite data also about field conditions so far as agriculture is concerned. Now, all that, if you, if it's a initiative, if RBI's day-to-day -day involvement is there, then naturally things move fast. But broadly, the idea is eventually we want to make it an open architecture. It will be open platform. We will gradually withdraw and hand it over to a private company like RBI did in the case of NPCI. And it will be an open architecture on which any bank or NBA, NBFC can onboard and take part and, you know, uh, uh, continue with their uh, uh, lending activities. Now the, uh, and this public tech platform, incidentally, I had mentioned about it in the last uh, globe, you know, the last GFF in September 2022. I had mentioned about commencement of pilots on end-to-end -end digitalization of small ticket agricultural loans known as the Kisan credit card loans, that is the KCC loans in a few states and our efforts to develop a platform to provide frictionless credit. Now that's a, the pilot is now a reality. The, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the pilot for KCC loans was launched in September 22 in select districts of two states and the pilot has enabled successful disbursal of agricultural loans of up to 1.6 lakh per borrower and without the requirement of any collateral. And this entire process is completed within a matter of few minutes. What is important is that for an agricultural loan, just imagine a farmer has to go to the bank branch earlier, he had to go, even now they go to the bank branch at least on an average five times. And multiple data he has to submit and the whole process takes little, you know, quite a bit of time. 
It's a challenge for the banks to get all the data. It's also a challenge for the agriculture, the farmer to collect all the information that the bank requires. And in the process, a lot of time is lost. And on an average, about a month or six weeks is taken for this entire process. Now through the KCC, you know, this platform which we have developed, the entire loan gets sanctioned in a matter of minutes. In fact, in less than 10 minutes. And I'm saying less than I'm saying less than two or ten minutes. I'm saying less than ten minutes, providing some cushion because you know sometimes the system also buffers because of internet connectivity, etc. But ten minutes is the maximum. So therefore, the system is working well. The experience has been very encouraging in the pilot. Similarly, we have launched this uh, public tech uh, platform now, and. Uh, uh, within a few minutes, these loans are collected and these loans are sanctioned. The KCC pilot has now been extended to many other states. A total of seven banks are now part of the digital KCC pilot. Now, we have now, as I mentioned, moved beyond these KCC loans and current uh, the currently, as I, as I mentioned, data required for credit appraisal exists in separate systems of different entities like central and state governments, technology and fintech companies, banks, service providers like credit information companies, digital identity authorities, etc. Accessing customer data available with multiple data sources is a challenge for both banks as it would require multiple integration with each information provider. It's also a challenge for the borrower. To enable frictionless credit, we have launched this pilot on 17th of August, that was last month, through a public tech platform. And the platform enables seamless flow of digital information from all the above sources to lenders obviating the need for multiple integrations. Now let me final, come to the final part of what I wanted to say, and that focuses on customer centricity, governance, and self-regulation. You see, as a regulator, it is our responsibility to maintain financial stability of the system. It is our responsibility to also see that there is customer centricity in every lending, whether it is by the conventional loan by a bank or by an NBS, NBFC or by FinTech, not just lending but any other kind of financial service which is provided and which falls in the regulator's domain. It's our responsibility to highlight on issues like customer centricity, governance and self-regulation. I would like to touch upon uh, certain key issues which are critical for the fintech ecosystem in particular to be stable and future ready. In this context, three critical issues, customer centricity, governance and self-regulation merit attention. Now I would urge and I would like to impress upon all the players in the fintech sector not to see these aspects as impediments, not to see these things as difficulties or creating barriers in your growth of business. I feel, as a regulator, we feel, and I'm sure most of you will agree, these are the things, if you do successfully, in our view, it will ensure the long-term sustainability and the long-term success of your product or your business model. In the dynamic and ever-evolving world of business, it's easy to get caught up in the pursuit of revenue, bottom lines, and the relentless drive for valuations. Sometimes it is forgotten that the success of any enterprise is intrinsically tied to the satisfaction and trust of its customers. This is the first critical issue which I wish to highlight. We must remember what Steve Jobs once said. I quote, you have got to start with the customer experience and work backwards. I repeat, you have, you have got to start with the customer experience and work backwards to the technology. To focus on, unquote, to focus on customer, customers means embracing a customer-centric approach to innovation by understanding the needs of customers, making provisions 
that protect customer interests and earn their trust. This calls for developing an organizational culture in which continuous feedback mechanisms are embedded in the business strategy. Designing solutions that safely and efficiently meet customer needs would not only elicit trust of customers, it would also meet business objectives in a sustainable manner. This can be achieved through simpli simplify simplified user interfaces and quick customer grievance redress mechanisms. Avoiding customer harassment is essential to achieving long-term customer trust. In this context, I would like to further add that digital innovations at times have also led to cyber risk and data security related issues. Illustratively, mushrooming of illegal loan apps, many of which had their origin in foreign jurisdictions, have led to serious concerns about the breach of data privacy, unethical business conduct, living of exorbitant interest rates, and harsh recovery practices. This highlights the urgent need to ensure that innovations are accompanied by prudential safeguards and responsible conduct. It is also imperative that regulated entities operate within the perimeter set by the licensing conditions and only undertake activities which are permitted under the regulations. The second critical aspect which I would like to highlight is the important role of governance in fintechs. By providing clear governance structures, fintechs can demonstrate their commitment to transparency, accountability, and responsible decision making. In fact, effective governance in fintechs require a collaborative effort involving regulators, industry associations, and the fintech community itself. Regulators play a critical role in addressing arbitrage, ensuring compliance with existing laws, and adapting regulations to technological advancements. Industry associations can facilitate development of best practices. They must proactively adopt high standards of governance. A robust governance structure encompasses clear delineation of roles and responsibilities, transparent decision-making processes, accountability mechanisms, and stakeholder engagement. Good governance must focus on ensuring effective oversight, ethical conduct, and risk management. Ultimately, it's good governance which should be key to durable and long-term success of any company, and in particular, the fintechs also. The third critical issue I would like to stress is the need to establish an effective self-regulatory structure, and this is very important. And this is absolutely necessary for the fintechs, for the fintech players themselves. Fintech players need to evolve industry best practices, privacy and data protection norms in sync with the law of the land, set standards to avoid mis-selling, promote ethical business practices, transparency of pricing, etc. I would like to use this opportunity to urge and encourage the fintechs to establish a self-regulatory organization or a SRO themselves. From Reserve Bank, we are willing to engage with you. In fact, we have self-regulatory organizations, what is called SROs, in other sectors also, where you know part of the regulation, part of the industry practices, part of the guidelines is managed by the SRO itself, which is a body of the industry players themselves. So I take this opportunity to make an appeal and to urge the fintech industry also to come forward and discuss with the Reserve Bank for formation of SROs. That will lead to two things. One, it will give you an opportunity to voice your requirements more frequently to the SRO, which is your organization. I mean, it's an organization to be created by you. The other advantage is that all the aspects of regulation will not be burdened on the reserving, Reserve Bank. There are aspects of regulation which the SRO 
can handle. So therefore, I would uh, like to use this opportunity to make an appeal to all of you to come forward and discuss the possible structure of a self-regulatory organization with the Reserve Bank of India and take it forward. And I do hope next year when we meet here in the 2024 edition, and I'm sure the organizers will announce the dates for next year's event uh, very shortly or very quickly. Next year when we meet, I would like to see an SRO to have either been actually formed or about to be formed, or we can probably launch the SRO next year in this event. In today's world, in today's world, one year is a long period of time. So I am saying next year as the outer limit, but I think there is possibility if we work together, we can do if this even faster. Let me now conclude. Technological innovation has unprecedented potential to make finance more inclusive, competitive, and robust. It is crucial that technological advancements in the world of fintech evolve in a responsible manner and are truly beneficial to the people at large. It's therefore vital for these innovations to be scalable and interoperable. Fintech players should themselves ensure responsible digital innovations. The Reserve Bank on its part will continue to drive the necessary regulatory and other policy measures to promote a vibrant and responsive fintech ecosystem. The Indian economy is growing rapidly and with it, the demand for financial services is also growing rapidly. The coming years hold immense promise and innovators across the world should explore these opportunities. I firmly believe that the Global FinTech Festival will emerge as a key global platform to unlock the full potential of the FinTech ecosystem, not only in India, but in other countries also. My best wishes to you all for the success of this Global FinTech Festival. Thank you very much. bracket, the tax labs I mean, has seen a minimum threefold increase in tax filing, some even achieving a nearly fourfold surge. <laughs>